Hey everyone, welcome to Office Hours with Cloud Posse, your weekly dose of insider DevOps trends, AWS news, and Terraform insights, all sourced from our Sweet Ops community, plus a live Q&A you can't find anywhere else. It's April 17th, 2024. I'm your host, Eric Osterman. Real quick, I'm the founder and CEO of Cloud Posse. We are a DevOps accelerator for funded startups and enterprises, and we help teams who are overwhelmed with AWS. We do this by leveraging our over 200 Terraform modules that have been downloaded over 100 million times. So no matter where you find yourself on this journey, we are here to help your company launch better products faster so you can free up your bandwidth for innovation and nail your value delivery every time. So if you or your team has been banging your head against the wall, just book a meeting with me directly. Go to cloudposse.com slash quiz. Again, cloudposse.com slash quiz and we will chart a roadmap to success for free. So how can you maximize today's session? First off, engage as much as you'd like. If you're curious about any of our open source tools or modules, go for it. And for those on the recording, we host these calls live, so don't miss out. Join us live by going to cloudposse.com slash office hours. Again, cloudposse.com slash office hours. So I do have one ask. If you do find any portion of today's session valuable, please share it with your team. You'll find the recording on our YouTube. Just go to youtube.com slash cloud posse. And while you're there, don't forget to subscribe. <laughs> so let's see here, uh, announcements, let's get started. So uh, small one, you know, it was kind of interesting uh, approach that Amazon took. Now I guess it was some eight years ago in 2016. Uh, they uh, they announced uh, AWS Snowmobile, which was literally a semi truck or a, a you know an eighteen wheeler that they rolled over to your facility to move storage over, uh, and then they could load it into uh, S three or whatever uh, Amazon services. So this pay this service has now uh, been removed from uh, the Amazon web page, and it's not often that Amazon kills services, uh, so. That's why I thought it was kind of notable to bring up. Yeah, although I I think they just replaced it with something that's like much smaller. Oh, okay, it's like oh, some yeah. suit some suitcase thing that you can now like put your your data into, and then um, and then like they pick it up or you ship it to them or something. Oh, like those little USB keys that, uh, you know, somebody gives you to exfiltrate all my data. Yeah. Although this is like, you know, a suitcase full of like SATA drives. Cause I think now because the, the, there's two things, right. That I think that internet speeds and backbone speeds have increased like significantly since 2016, but also that um, like the, the cost of drives has gone like way down. So you can get so much more storage and smaller space than you used to be able to that, uh, that I think this makes it like much, much easier now. That's an interesting observation. Yeah. Yeah. I think if you, if, it might be in this, I read a different article, but I, they said that they replaced it with another, it's another snow something. It's not, uh, it's not, uh there you go snow snowball edge which clients return to mail after filling them with data hmm. yeah so that's what their that's what their replacement is i knew it was a snow something but and then they have another one that's called like snow cone or something that has some that also is um somewhat uh it's it's like a small suitcase thing that they send to you yeah there you go. Hmm. Really interesting. Yeah. All right. Uh, next announcement was one you shared with me. I didn't really have a chance to check it out. Um, I know we reported on some other similar service kind of giving you a, a spot instance weather map uh, across the, the globe. Now, this is uh, something similar to that, but by AWS. Uh, yeah, so this is AWS. Actually, this is AWS looking at the rest of the world. So they actually have so many peering connections in so many geographies now that they're like one of the in one of the best spots to tell like the the actual health of the internet. Like 
across the entire globe. So now they, they basically are um, monitoring like all the peering connections in like every geography and they have a map that shows you if there's anything like it's kind of like red, yellow, green um, on a map, which seems pretty cool. And then you can drill down in any one of those areas and it will actually tell you like the different backbones that might be having performance issues or or jitter or latency or drop packets or, you know, any of that kind of stuff. So it seems yeah. pretty cool. Yeah, totally. Has anyone already... I'm at, oh, I was just going to say, I'm a network geek at heart. This is where, like, this is actually how I came up through the ranks uh, uh, doing networking. So this uh, this is, like, near and dear to my heart to be able to see this. I wish I had this, like, 20 years ago. It would have been really helpful. Yeah. All right, next announcement is... Um... It, this looked like a uh, personal project, uh, not so much as a like a business backing it, but a, a fully open source re-implementation of Apple's code signing algorithm and notarization using the newly available uh, notarization API. Uh, this is exciting because it means you can then sign uh, binaries that are built on Linux systems, for example, and not on uh, Mac OS only. So uh, that, yeah. Anyone have more context to this? I, I think the this obviously opens it up to one of the one of the main reasons people were like running everything on. Um, on like specialized Apple hardware um, and all of that was because you could only you could only code sign using like a certain ways and I think this is now like if I understand it correctly I only surface glance at it but what I understand now is is that you can um, you can actually now notarize your binaries from um, from other platforms other than Mac OS so the the idea is that if you have a compiler that can build and target for Mac OS, um, like a lot of people are building now um, on like the Linux platform, particularly, um, you can now run your entire like build and sign pipeline and publish to like the app store and all of that kind of thing without needing to actually ever run it on like Mac OS hardware. So um, it definitely opens that up, which seems pretty cool. Yeah, that's cool. AJ, were you going to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say, wasn't Apple being sued by the Justice Department? Um, oh, Apple's the... always being sued by the, <laughs> by the Justice Department. <laughs> I mean, yeah. this is like a recent thing saying they're for competition or something like that. I don't know. Yeah, if that was... yeah, I forget. I think that's that's a that's actually an App Store thing. So the 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 well, at least in Europe. Um, in Europe, they had a ruling that that Apple needed to um, needed to allow third party app stores uh, to be able to run on their platform to not be considered a monopoly, essentially. Um, so I, I think it went into effect because I saw that Epic Games, who is the big proponent of that whole thing and um, famously stood their ground and wouldn't allow um uh, Minecraft to be sold um, to be sold through the App Store because they didn't want to share their uh, you know their revenue. Um, basically, like that happened in Europe, and then I think that the uh, that the US DOJ has kind of um, has kind of followed suit to try to uh, to try to get that um, uh, the same treatment that they have now in Europe that because Europe has been implemented. Yep, exactly. So the same thing's going down here. Uh, is this signing stuff, do you think, uh, them opening up an API, uh, do you think related to some of this or just- I'm not sure. I know that, um, I, I know that they uh, they somehow still tried to screw Epic Games. They, they revoked Epic Games. Uh, developer account 
from the European um, app store when this first happened because they were claiming that they were they were not following the rules and it was this whole tiff for them still trying to not let Epic launch the Epic App Store in Europe. But I haven't followed recently. That was probably that was a quickly month ago. reversed. They quickly said, uh, "No, we're good. You're back." Oh, did they? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I think it was a last minute flex. Uh, hmm. So uh, another uh, announcement, it's nothing new for office hours, but what is new is that uh, Neon, the database is now uh, GA. Uh, this is what I wish like Amazon Aurora could be. Uh, it, it adds one of these really awesome abilities to have uh, uh, branched databases. So you could create a branch off of, uh, for example, um, it, your staging environment to for every pull request that you want to test. Um, and then when you're done, you can just destroy that branch. Um, so you don't have to uh, orchestrate complicated ways of uh, orchestrating the, the backup and restore of your database, because the database has Git-like concepts of branching. Yeah. Um, same thing with planet scale on MySQL. They do the same thing. Right. Uh, that was, uh, we, we brought them up recently as well. I think, um, I, I, they were just changing something relating to their licenses. I forget what it was though. Oh, really? Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Let's license. Have you folks rolled out neon to any customers? <laughs> yeah, so I say this from my armchair to be totally <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, here's the deal: is that uh, as as cool as these things are, my my default is to always go with something some managed service. So the, there are a lot of better ways to run Kubernetes out there, but I rather just have one that's fully managed by AWS, not another vendor, not another uh, system. Yeah, so, I hear that and agree. Yeah. And for planet scale, I've used it. Um, I've used it pretty extensively on uh, what I'll I'll term a hobby project or a, a hobby plus project, and I've been pretty impressed with how it all works. Um, and I did it specifically because I wanted to be able to support like preview environments with I I, I built something with Vercel and um, Next.js, and I wanted to actually be able to. Uh, do preview environments on the database side as well. And it, it tied in pretty well to, to doing that and then merging and doing the data schema migrations on merge domain, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, it's also worth noting just coincidentally, um, if you wanted to add to the, uh, it's Neon and also um, Superbase uh, went to GA this week um, as well. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. All right, cool. So Superbase is basically uh, open source Firebase if anyone uh, if anyone is following around, uh, you know, obviously concentrated on the data side, but they also have, if you click on the little product drop down, you can see they have like off and, you know, um, you know, storage edge functions, like all the, all sorts of things as well so yeah. all right um so another challenge has been now that we have two registries when we only had one before finding uh modules uh is going to be more and more fractured especially as some developers are only publishing their modules perhaps to uh open tofu's registry and while open tofu has done a good job of trying to um capture most of the open source out there uh, to, to be congruent with uh, the re official registry, uh, that I, I'm assuming that that could continue to diverge. So uh, library.tf is an attempt to unify this uh, by providing a search engine uh, for all registries. Also notable is that uh, OpenTofu doesn't have a graphical web UI yet for the registry. It's just a programmatic registry API endpoint. Uh, this is now, you could say, a front end. It, this is not official by OpenTofu, 
uh, Scalar is one of the vendors involved in the Open Tofu fork. Um, and I believe there will still be an official uh, Open Tofu registry. But in the meantime, this is a great alternative, as well as something that gives you the benefit of searching all registries quickly. So let's test it out. I haven't yet. <laughs> all right. So far, that passes. Cloud Posse's. Is this uh, no label? Yep. There we go. Looks very familiar, similar to um, the HashiCorp registry and look and feel, although uh, more extremely rounded edges. <laughs> All right. Border, next... ra border radius eight. <laughs> if that's enough. All right. Uh, so here's another one. Um, you know, we, we had another post, uh, I think it was a post in a GitHub issue somewhere, and we never turned it into an actual post. It was just a very popular GitHub issue. Uh, Jeremy Grodberg on our team is the closest thing you could say to a PhD Terraformer, uh, if there is such a thing. Um, people, people on this uh, call who have worked with Jeremy will understand this. He has gone to a depth greater than most have ever uh, when it comes to understanding problems with Terraform. So if you want to kind of have a better understanding of why these uh, problems occur, but more importantly, how you might mitigate them, because we've had to come up with so many workarounds and hacks for that over the years, he's the one who's come up with those. And this is a good write-up on all of those workarounds. I confess, I don't know as much of the technical details uh, since I'm not on the day-to-day, -day, uh, but this is a very thorough write-up. And related to that is some exciting news. I'm kind of jumping around here, but in HashiCorp uh, Terraform 1.9, which is you know alpha not to be released, they just released Terraform 1.8, so this is gonna be a little while. But the exciting thing here is that they're introducing a new experiment that might make these kinds of problems go away in the future. Uh, and that experiment is to allow deferral of things that need to know the values at apply time. Or uh, I believe that's, yeah. So that, that uh, affects both count and for each, which uh, in different ways have their own um, downsides when it comes to deferred computation of values. All right, that was that. Let's see here. All right, so last week we had a uh, extensive conversation on everything going on between HashiCorp and OpenTofu uh, regarding the cease and desist that was sent um, and subsequent media blitz that uh, came out that kind of tried to throw um, throw dirt on the OpenTofu fork. Uh, I think the gist of it is that, you know, <laughs> divorce is unfriendly sometimes and things are said uh, that aren't always true. And in a 50 page detailed uh, response by, um, oh, this is the cease and desist. I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. It, oh, I, they're looking all in the wrong place. Come on, quick, quick, there we go. Uh, I don't understand. That's not the right link. Our response. And that's going to the yeah. season. I don't think so. I think that is the response. Oh, oh. It's re. Oh, re the okay. yeah, you know, it, I, I didn't remember that it was a PDF that was also redacted. I thought it was an HTML form. So my bad. All right. So, uh, yeah, here is their response. It's, um, but I still. Yeah, it's that one. This is the one that, oh, okay. So this is the full breakdown that's 50 pages. Here's their response. Okay, yeah, yeah sorry. Yeah, the response uh, refers to that other document basically, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So 
I guess it could be helpful to understand first, um, if we take a step back, and we do look at the cease and desist letter. Uh, this is the thing that started it all. Uh, it wasn't made available until after uh, Open Tofu's response, and they they released that as part of their response here. It's been redacted to protect the individuals. Obviously, this is company to uh, you know nonprofit. This is not person to person. Uh, so please don't harass uh, people on either side here. So uh, some of the uh, notable things I thought about this cease and desist was also how they went about it. So it's been you know public knowledge for some time, the files that were called into question here. And those uh, you know are those changes are refuted elsewhere. But what I thought was really kind of embarrassing was, how the law firm went about showing that these were similar. And they're using like Latera word for, uh, Latera compare for word. And yeah, that makes sense if you are comparing two academic papers maybe in a college, uh, it, but it doesn't make sense for comparing code into mature code bases. And that's where the crux of the problem lies in, in arguing that they are infringing on the copyright because it doesn't follow how these things are, how code is written. So if we go into the response by um, Open Tofu, I think the, the hot thing to highlight here, which I thought was uh, pretty, pretty diplomatic and is honestly how responsible companies and organizations and adults should behave. And it's this statement. In the future, if you should have any concerns or questions about how source code in Open Tofu is developed, we would ask that you contact us first, immediately issuing a DMCA takedown notice and igniting salacious negative press articles is not the most help helpful path to resolving concerns like these. And that's it in a nutshell. I think that you know, if there are serious concerns and you're seriously wanting to get them resolved, you don't have to default to a DMCA, especially when the other party is more than willing to make sure that they aren't and have every incentive to make sure that they aren't infringing on this. And that's why I think this ultimately is going to have more of a Streisand effect for HashiCorp where the act of trying to silence it and squash the project actually makes the project explode in popularity or gets everybody uh, more aware of the project. Any uh, more commentary? The the only thing that I would just really comment about was the, you know, the Latera tool that they're using is actually like a tool that lawyers use all the time so that when when you're passing documents back and forth you you compare version one versus version two so that people aren't trying to slip language in there um, between two versions that you don't catch so i think it's just their the normal thing they use in their toolbox rather than yeah. um, some way that they actually said like this is the best way to you know ensure code uh, uh, we can show code differences, I think, which is why they, you know, right. they defaulted to but, that, but they pointed to the links like on GitHub themselves. So, yeah. Right. No, I, it makes total sense to me why they would use a tool like Literia, being the lawyer, yeah. being lawyers, and that's what they're familiar with. It's yeah. just, that, uh, how do I, how, what's a better analogy? It's like, it's the wrong tool for the job is the fundamental thing. And hashi yeah, or yeah should be advising their lawyers on how to make a stronger case and not letting you know the the lawyers kind of make a fool of themselves using this to compare code like this here is meaningful this is you know this diagram here or this uh picture here is how you need to compare those differences to understand what's going on sure. not thing for you know comparing pros yeah i think though just to be clear, like I, I'm the argument I'm, at, I'm making is that from the lawyer's perspective, and I'm not trying to stick up for them, but from, from the lawyer's perspective, what's happening is they're they're trying to document a legal case, yeah, um, and like pointing to external external things and everything that aren't in a document. If it ends up in court, like 
the judge is not going to go click on links to GitHub and go view on everything like this. Like he's going to look for the paper or she's going to look for the paper yeah. that says like, what, what are the differences in the format that I'm used, used to see differences in? You know? Yada, yada, yada. So I think that's the reason and, they did it rather than anything else. But yeah, I, I, I hear you. Like it definitely was not the most efficient way, but they were trying to build the legal case too, right? As part of that's the whole true. thing. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. So fair point. Like you, you need to have all the content in one place. That effectively does that. Uh, yeah. Playing devil's advocate a little bit here, um, it is probably you know more in their favor to show it in that way than to show it in this way. Um, and obviously, and I, you know, I have no insider insights on on this whole thing or what's going on. Uh, I don't know that. You know this is settled. Uh, obviously, I think uh, Open Tofu has made a very strong case in their response, but I don't know when this is considered resolved. Ah, big big point. Somebody pointed out at the end of last office hours. Uh, let's see if I can find this fast enough here. That someone had uh, commented. Uh, where is it? commented on on the issue that was opened up in uh, the HashiCorp code in the open tofu code base uh, which basically said was from the original author hey I reached out to I think his name was Adam um, and we sorted things out and they have posted an official retraction on the info world article based on all of this so in in the court of public opinion I think this is you know kind of settled. But it's not settled until, uh, you know, the powers that be uh, say so. So let's see here where, where that was. Uh, open tofu. Well, you're finding that it was that somebody had reached out to the author to say, hey, what's the status on this? And they got back saying it was coming, it was going to all be settled soon. And then yeah. the update is at the top of the document now that yeah. says basically, um, yeah, that this no longer seems like copyright infringement. Yeah. And uh, as clarified here, this, this has no bearing on what HashiCorp's going to do, but InfoWorld. Um, has uh, done the right thing. So here's the InfoWorld article. And uh, here's the update to that. And the author's assertion is uh, that Open Tofu community did not misappropriate HashiCorp's intellectual property. So uh, that was, uh, you know, uh, Matt Assay, one um, post, and then this one here was uh, someone else who had opened a issue kind of referring to that article. And they also retracted theirs much faster after seeing the evidence. All right, let's see. Um, so we covered the cease and desist, the response, obviously not going to go over the 50 pages there, but we'll link that if you want to look at it. And all of this is kind of interesting. Um, look, open tofu is nothing new in terms of forking a project after it goes commercially licensed. Uh, Elasticsearch is, you know, prime example of that with Amazon Open Search. Uh, and uh, there is an interesting <laughs> trend I've seen now that. Uh, open tofu is being uh, maybe because of the recency, but also because of the success of the movement, arguably, arguably uh, being shown as an example of actually how you can open source a, a project or keep it open source after a uh, fork happens. Um, in this case here, it's also interesting how uh, the Linux Foundation is uh, leading this fight. <laughs> against open source, uh, a fun play on word. So my concern about everything that's happening right now is that there's gonna be some level of mistrust 
of vendors starting with open source and that they're going to just change the license when they reach critical mass because that's what you do. And I don't blame open source vendors. I understand the capitalistic element. I understand the, the pressure and the feeling maybe that you you have to do that when you know such a small percentage of your users actually you know pony up and help support the project. At the same time, I feel like it kind of sets us back 15 years uh, in 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 support of open source and all the gains that have been made and the trust that has been made because I remember a day when you know you had to fight to get something like MySQL used in an organization and now that's the default mode. The default now is companies just use open source. Look, are are a few of these things falling or changing license going to change things? No, it's not. But it, there is a tipping point, and there's a point where companies start asking, you know, what what are the risks of adopting this open source from a licensing standpoint? If we come to depend, build our business and depend on it, so uh, you could say Linux Foundation is providing um, some assurances here that for successful projects. You know that you come and depend on and if you know there's significant license changes and there's a community in support of it maybe there's going to be a fork and that project lives on as open source and i guess that's uh i, I kind of like that any uh any thoughts on this I have I have a couple as usual. <laughs> um, one one thing that I think it all boils down to we as you know as a technology community, um, you know, as a software development community, whatever, need to figure out a way to compensate people for the great products that they build. Um, and I think that, like, you know, the HashiCorp, you know, as an example, again, I don't want to be a HashiCorp defender here, but at the end of the day, like, they did shepherd and build for the most part. I mean, obviously, other community members participated, but they were the, the main drivers of building Terraform. And it's a tool that, you know, tens of thousands of companies use like uh, across the world and they they derive no no revenue from from that yeah. um unless someone chooses to buy their ancillary product that they add on to that one and you know i guess one could argue that that they didn't create a, a, a compelling enough ancillary product to add on to the really solid product that they built that everyone wants to use to, to monetize <laughs> it. But but that that doesn't mean that they still didn't create like yeah. a phenomenal product that everyone wants to use. So like, I mean, you know, it, it's pretty crazy, but if you, you know, if, if every company that, that used Terraform paid, you know, a hundred or a thousand dollars a year or something to, to HashiCorp, you know, some small token amount, yeah. it would probably dwarf the revenue that they generate from Terraform Cloud and they actually wouldn't need like to to make that the only viable way and try to stifle yeah. competition because like people were doing it. And I'm not saying like directly, but if there was some way to be like, you know, if you're if you're a company that uses open source, you just pay like this open source tax and somehow it's like, yeah. you know, equitably, equitably distributed to all the people who build open source projects out there. Like we would have a lot less of this happening. Um, you know, I, I don't know that I have the, the real answer, but I think that's the core of what the problem is, is people spend, you know, enormous amounts of, you know, intellectual capital um, and sometimes real capital in building these products and then don't get anything out of it. And, and then the community gets mad at them for trying to then yeah. like you know make a living at yeah. at building the you know the products that everyone's using it's kind of a it's like a, a vicious circle so um 
if there were no open source, like we'd have a lot less innovation in the world, right? And in the in this, you know, closed world, wherever we want to look at it. But um, but then if we only had open source, then no one would be able to afford to build open source because no one would be employed. So it's like a it's a really hard uh, it's a really hard catch twenty two situation. I, I, yeah, and I think that was really well put, and I, I agree with the points. And obviously, we are, we, you know, as a company, we should be more as cloud posse as a company doing open source. Very sympathetic uh, to the position of you know producing a lot of open source, but being able to capitalize on much much fewer than one percent of people using. Yeah, yeah. and and just l without opening the Komodo and doing too much, you know, with cloud posse, I mean. We're actually in the same exact position as HashiCorp, right? We yeah, we, we develop a ton of a ton of open source modules and tools and everything that that people use. You know, millions and millions of downloads of these things, and um, we don't actually generate any revenue from that. We only generate revenue if someone chooses to hire us to do consulting to work on top of those modules there. Um, you know, as well. So it's like it, we've we've arguably built a somewhat compelling offering to go alongside all of the great open source that we've developed, but um, still haven't probably not nearly as much um, of a financial windfall as it would be if everyone that used cloud policy modules paid, you know, a, a small token fee, uh, you know, every, every year or every month or whatever that they use. So um, it's a pretty, uh, it, it's a paradigm. I think that has that problem, like that problem exists over and over and over for anyone who's building like large amounts of open source. So, yeah. And and so my epiphany kind of lately has been a little bit like feeling like we're, you know, open source is having its Spotify moment uh, in, in this sense where, uh, you know, all of these music, let's take a, a quick uh, jump back. You know, there's this, uh, movie on netflix uh called was it uh, was super pumped was the uber one i forget what the oh, playlist the playlist or something was uh, the documentary on spotify and i couldn't help but empathize in some of these parts here is that you know artists for the longest time had no good way to capitalize on their music uh so spotify came out as a way to make that possible and and bring publicity and uh, hopefully some money or income to smaller bands uh, and musicians on the platform. And at the time, there was a lot of headwinds just to even make it possible, but the end result would be arguably that bands still are not, they, they might improve some discoverability being on the platform, but they're not making a living on the platform. And, uh, you know, the, while music was never free, it was free in that illegal kind of way. I mean, you know, Pirate Bay and so forth. Uh, and then people find their own ways to sponsor the, the musicians. So open source, look, licenses, totally free. You can do whatever you want. You're not doing anything illegal. Don't worry about it. And, you know, there's been talk about couldn't there only be some kind of a tax or some kind of a way that money is redistributed amongst open source. And I can't help but feel it would just be another Spotify-like situation where sure, some of the biggest projects out there receive even more funding, but smaller projects uh, still don't get anything that is meaningful to be able to continue developing and supporting it. And well, let me just, can I just chime why? in for a second? So I, I, I actually work for a record label. That's my whole job. Is oh, really interesting. exactly this kind of licensing yeah um it's immensely immensely complicated uh there's a lot of corruption in it and as you say the artists get screwed all the time right it's a super long tail right so you have your really big big artists and they have managers and legal teams and stuff like that and they you know get their piece of the pie um, but the long tail is essentially zero for almost everybody. Yeah. And then yeah. there's the licensing like ASCAP and, you know, like these companies that just do like mechanical licensing and things like that. And then they're taking their cut and it's like, it's, it's an untenable model really. Like you don't want to re-implement that software. I can tell you that much for sure. Um, but yeah, the idea, like the, 
you know, the, the dream of that kind of licensing I, is great. And that's, but, but it has already been implemented in music and it's, I, I, I don't think we want to re-implement that. I agree. Yeah. And, and See, but although, the, oh, sorry, go ahead, Matt. I, I'm just, you know, I, I hear what you folks are saying and I, I, th I think we can point at that as a good example of like, ooh, there could be a bad way to go down that path. But don't you think that um, it feels like particularly because this would be a, I think about it as like, this is a package manager, basically. This is NPM being a potential um, or, or the Terraform registry or whatever being the potential thing that you're paying dues to, or you're paying that tax to. And it feels like because that's, separated across whatever ecosystem software development language you're you're involved in um then it's not one entity it's not one business who's trying to make a buck right it is many different and and maybe there's a um like a a schema or an you know a a spec that all these package managers speak to that that allows them to do that tax and then pay out to the the you know packages that are installed but install numbers go up and that means money going to the the project that feels like it could be doable um whereas it's not a large huge company that's doing all software distribution to to projects it's many many small ones um, until, and the package until, managers would be the way to do that. Anyway, go ahead. I mean, until until institutional money comes and starts consolidating all of those into one thing, which is what tends to happen, right? Like, the, yeah, it's right now, it's like this distributed system, but that doesn't, like once there's money involved, then private equity is just going to buy all of those and then it's going to be one thing and then they're <laughs> going to and then they're gonna control it. That's, I mean, that's just what happens. It's, not a bad point. Yeah. yeah, that's a really good although, point. Although I, I, with all due respect, Robert, I think that the, you know, the, the music industry is probably not a great example of, uh, of how we want to do things right now. Because like, if, if someone were actually starting again, like how music gets made, like right now, like, re like 2024, I'm not saying historically, but like record labels seem almost like unnecessary. Um, these days, and, and I'm not saying that you don't do anything, but I'm certainly saying that record labels do not play do do not play nearly the you know the the role they played when their relationships are the things that let them walk into the biggest radio stations and hand them a record and say play this you know three times an hour for the next you know for the next ten days so my artists can sell more albums and build the tour and do all that kind of thing like all that. Oh, like the the um, digitalization of the world and our our reach and all of those things and the Spotify's and whatever of the world have certainly let artists um, eliminate some of those middlemen and I think that it's definitely eliminated a lot of the barriers to entry but it it has I think Jeremy um, posted in here that it also has made it a little bit more complicated in that you now need to sign up to you know, six different music distribution services and, you know, have four different, like, you know, accounts to do all these things to make that all work. But at the end of the day, you can make it all work without a quote unquote middleman in, you know, in, in, in the path of you, uh, if you choose to do so, um, sure. you know, somewhat. No, so I, I think it's, I, I there's definitely I, I, something I, there. I, I mean, I couldn't agree more that, um, the record label model is not what we would wa want to follow. Um, but it's just a cautionary tale because it wasn't yeah, intended to be what it is either. Right. <laughs> I mean, it was well, exactly like a way it was for, intended, it was, it, it was, was a way for musicians to get paid for, for their, well, I mean, it started before <laughs> that, right. The labels represent the institutional money that I'm talking about. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, yeah. they just, they just like, once money is changing hands, then business people get involved and, you know, their goal is to maximize the revenues and that tends to lead to consolidation and all these unintended, you know, like 
side effects. That's all. Like, yeah, yeah definitely uh, don't do, definitely don't re-implement the yeah, music the, business for software. Yeah. <laughs> That's an interesting idea, Matt. You were saying, I, I, I'll i be honest, I was kind of poo-pooing on, on my head, in my head. But then when I got to thinking about it, like now, what if there was, okay, for starters, what if there was an option to have a paid registry, for example, for Terraform? You can always use the free ones. But at least give away for people, you know, make it away like, hey, if you use this registry, you will be supporting the authors who are, uh, you know, producing that code. Now, yeah, you can I mean, see it directly, but. Even if, imagine if like the Linux Foundation, as an example, I, ran, ran a, ran a, like a, a package manager, if you will, that, you know, yeah. that as Matt were talking about that can track how many artifacts are downloaded by each project. People could even just like randomly contribute whatever they want to the Linux Foundation. And then the proceeds could then be distributed based on popularity of the thing that's being downloaded, you know, out there. So, um, and you know, it would at least be a start that people could, could figure out some way to to start, you know, sponsorship buttons on individual projects, of, you know, some work out, right? And some people have Patreons and, you know, a bunch of other things to support the projects, but but there is no like holistic effort to to doing that. Like as an example, you know, the, the fortune the fortune one hundreds of the world can can certainly can certainly afford to to put, you know, a few million dollars a year into the, you know, into the Linux Foundation pot. For all the open source they use, in, you know, to generate their billions of dollars of, of revenue, uh, that could be split up among like all these people. So it'd be a, an interesting, uh, an interesting pursuit if we could do something like that. I really think we're like on to something with that idea. Like I would love to implement that paid Terraform registry and have it be an open source project. And even if it's yeah, just the option. Of course, the existing registries are still going to be there. But if you were even if it's a cent per download or something like that, if you were to give somebody the option as a proof of concept, an idea that like, hey, this could be the future of what we do for mm -hmm. registries across the software spectrum, that could be really cool. I don't know. Um, and yeah, I keep thinking of crypto around this too. Like Jeremy's bringing it up in the you know comments. If there is one, that would be really, uh, like I think that crypto I think it kind was of the guy who did homebrew. This. Oh. I, th I thought that the, that there was somebody who split off from homebrew um, and made something that is sort of crypto based. I'll, I'll see if I can find the name of it. Yeah, you brought one of those up. I remember I, I immediately like, you know, any barrier to something like this, like, oh, I got to figure out a way to pay in crypto now. I'm, I'm sure, you know, that's a large percentage of people who use this stuff, maybe, but still doesn't seem i'm not gonna figure it out yeah i wouldn't figure uh, out anything in crypto either but i think that crypto has the ability to yeah there's actual a use case for crypto probably within this problem space and i think this problem space is really interesting because it is a serious problem like people should be compensated and it shouldn't be that we get to a point where companies like hashicorp or redis end up being i'm gonna flip the table and change my license like i feel for them I'm also uh, objectively against it in the way that they went about it, but yeah. All right, uh, just a couple more things. And then, um, well, maybe a quick talk on the question that we got. Um, I think, yeah, just this is a very quick one here. So uh, there was a report that uh, people are having um, slower run times on Terraform uh, 1.8. I know one of our customers hadn't pinned their version of Terraform and while they were doing development, suddenly everything just started to crash Terraform, like full on stack um, exceptions. And it turned out, well, 1.8 had just been released. So uh, that was breaking some of the Terraform they had. So if you're having issues and things seem slower, this might be one. Uh, next, uh, Matt, you Let's see here. Oh, right. This one might be a little bit longer, but yeah, eight minutes. Uh, Matt, you want to talk about uh, your experience migrating to uh, OpenTofu? Yeah. Um, 
link will be in uh you know there's an article on it but uh yeah we we migrated one of our decent sized client projects uh to open tofu it was on cloud posse stack using a lot of cloud posse modules and components cuz we're big supporters and help help uh maintain and whatnot so um this goes into that really what we needed to do um and it was personally me cuz i was i was very interested to try out open tofu on a on a you know non trivial project uh and you know there's some open source contributions that went into it um there was some you know just hey we need to tell our automation how to run tofu and and what does that look like uh and then you know I, the the result of it is hey we didn't run into any actual terraform code needing to to be changed which i was pretty excited about and there were no errors so it was this um changes need to be made but it was around our setup more than it was around our actual terraform code and we're we're talking about you know um 39,000 lines of Terraform code across 480 files. So it was a non-trivial Terraform project. Um, you know, we've worked on larger, we've worked on a lot smaller, but like uh, there's some good good info in, in, in here. And yeah, I don't know. We I was, uh, I did this in less than eight hours across about a week um, and we were excited. Uh, I think that I wanted to put this out there um, and, and share our experience purely because it feels like this, this was pretty turnkey. Like it was a good, good switch. Um, and we were happy to be, you know, early adopters, uh, and anybody, anybody wants to ask questions, uh, I'm always around in Slack or, you know, feel free to shout here, but that's the gist. And this was a couple of weeks ago, right? So everything's been going smoothly since then. This was a couple months ago. So we did this actually at the end of January. It probably shipped in early February. Um, things have been going very smoothly. The only thing that I have noticed is that their registry every once in a while have to run another init. And mm -hmm. I think they're actively working on it. Like I opened an issue surrounding one of the registry issues that I had early on. And it was about one of our modules that we pushed a fix to. And then I was looking to use the new version, the new new published tag, and that tag wasn't published. And I, I opened an issue um, and I brought it up in Slack and they were like on it within an hour, uh, like a couple hours. And then somebody was like staying up late, you know, their time Europe um their their european time to like help me fix it and they got a fix and it was a really great experience so yeah we've had nothing but good things to say and i think that they're just working through some issues with the registry which you know the amount of times that i've run into it is very minimal and i would say is pretty reasonable considering they had to build a new registry from scratch you know just a couple months ago that reminds me of something else I should have announced, which is really cool uh, on the Open Tofu project. They just added this. It's a GitHub action that runs and surfaces the most popular uh, issues being upvoted in, uh, in the project. I wish more projects did this. It gives an incentive for using thumbs up and thumbs down and not doing plus one because this is not counting plus ones. Uh, and... Uh, and they've seen, after releasing this, they've seen immediate uptick in voting uh, on issues. So that's going to help them uh, drive their roadmap on what they focus on. Uh, Matt, you pointed out something here, uh, you know, like this is one, where was it? Uh, support for OCI registries is now number three. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, this, this would be the ability to just publish modules to any you know, registry that supports OCI. So you don't have to support some custom um, uh, Terraform registry. And uh, unfortunately, dynamic providers are still the most popular. My point on this is you're doing something wrong if you need dynamic providers, but that's a topic for another day. Um. All right, let's see here. We got not much more time. Um, uh, Ranjith, are you on the call today? Yes. Uh, hey, uh, Eric. 
Hey, I, I saw your uh, your question here, and it was a good one in, in our Slack. Um, I don't think we have that much time to give it a fair response uh, today, but uh, I thought I could at least uh, see what we can add to it. Um, so you're, you're asking how people are managing more uh, mature or robust rollouts of services on ECS. And your current stack consists of Terragrunt, Atlantis, uh, for pull request automation. And you'd like some way to be able to run automated tests on that service. Uh, and if uh, those validate, then progress that deployment to the next stage. Uh, and if it fails, perhaps roll it back. And you're wondering how teams have gone about this uh, for ECS. And one of the things you wonder is, you know, is step functions the right way for doing this? And what I'd like to say is add my kind of two cents to this, taking a step back. What is so nice about ECS is, first of all, it's a platform. You don't really need to worry about upgrading every month like Kubernetes. It is simple enough that you can get almost like a Heroku-like experience deploying apps to it. Um, you know, if you're just worrying about a single container and connecting that to a load balancer. It's pretty easy to terraform the tasks, so that's also kind of nice. But you know where it really sucks is when you're trying to orchestrate what an operator should do. And this is where I feel like AWS just uses their get out of jail free card every time. Ah, just use a Lambda for that. And yes, you could do a Lambda for that. Maybe you could use some step functions for that. My point is more though, if you start needing to do some of those things, is ECS still the right choice to orchestrate that? And is Terraform the right tool to do it in? Terraform is like a sledgehammer. It lets you do big bang operations, like bring things up, tear it down, update it, but it doesn't really know how to do the order of operations and do rollbacks and things like that. In fact, one of the things we often say as an example with doing Terraform is running Terraform is a lot more similar to running database migrations than application deployments. Uh, and, and those database migrations have the benefit of transactions while Terraform doesn't. So when you run Terraform, there's no concept of rollbacks there. So how you orchestrate that rollback in your Terraform is custom. So I know a ways back we had tried to use uh, AWS Code Deploy together with ECS, together with Terraform, and that was a big mistake. It was incredibly complicated, and Terraform isn't very good at managing Code Deploy or anything that has also state not managed uh, entirely by Terraform itself, or where state can be changing as a result of things happening in AWS. So we at Cloud Posse are doing, interestingly enough, more and more ECS implementations than Kubernetes implementations, something weird happened over the past year. So ECS is gaining in popularity, uh, but we don't, really recommend trying to orchestrate something too elaborate when you are using ECS because then you're losing the benefit of using it. And I'll stop there. I know we're over time. Anyone else have something they want to add to this? So I'll, um, I, I'd be happy to talk more about this uh, next week as well on ECS. Uh, because I am personally interested as well as to how people are solving ETS deployments in an elegant manner that is reusable across organizations and companies. Um, because the best we've come up with is a hybrid approach um, uh, using Terraform together with other tools to get a smooth rollout process. But again, I don't want to get into that right now because we're over time. Um, are you able to make it next week, uh, Ranjit? I can try. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, right. It's a bit late for me, uh, but uh, I can try. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about time zone differences there. All no. right. Well, we're going to wrap between, things. Yep. In between, if you have any kind of uh, link uh, information, I see you already uh, uh, sent, a, uh, some, uh, sent a link to 
information on the slack channel if, if there is anything else in that uh, you know uh, with the similar pointers right uh, where folks have done this uh, yeah uh, please do you know, yeah for sure um, I, I basically in that thread I shared uh, kind of our current thinking on this and what our current strategy is uh, we're using something uh, with uh, Espresso, which is a third-party open source tool together with Terraform. Um, and then we're also kind of keeping an eye on what's happening with Copilot. Uh, I think Copilot has the potential to improve things with ECS, much like Helm has done and Customize has done for Kubernetes. Uh, but it's still not there yet. So. All right, we'll, uh, we'll talk more about that next week. Stay tuned. Uh, thanks again, everyone, for participating in Office Hours. We're going to be posting a recording of this session to our YouTube channel. So if you haven't yet subscribed, please go to youtube.com slash cloudposse. You're going to find today's recording there. And uh, please up, upvote and like those videos. It helps us out a great deal with distribution. We post our Office Hours also as a podcast. So if you listen to podcasts, uh, you can listen to Office Hours. Go to podcast.cloudposse.com and subscribe there. Finally, if you are interested in working with Cloud Posse and seeing if we can move the needle for you at your organization, go to cloudposse.com slash quiz, answer a few quick questions and book a meeting with me directly, and we'll go over your situation. Again, that's cloudposse.com slash quiz. Talk to you next week, same time, same place.